will. Hello, hello. Uh, it has been a second. Um, yeah, haven't been streaming too much. Kind of uh, fell out of love with it a little bit, but that's okay. Um, last time I was streaming, I think we were doing some Baldur's Gate three, but I was having a lot of technical issues. Um, because my p yeah my PC is not it's not good enough. So I'm gonna stick to I'm gonna stick to the stuff that uh, it is good at. Uh, today is just gonna be a super chill day. I'm just going to be um, pretty much just um, watching some YouTube videos. Essentially, um, the idea that I had for today is that I was going to watch some D and D like uh, character builds essentially on YouTube because they're super popular with some of my players. So I thought I would check um, some of these creators out and we we're going to, I was going to rule check them is what I was going to do. Uh, we were going to sit there and we were going to rule check them and judge them for breaking the rules. No, just kidding. We're not going to judge them. Maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit because they do at the end of the day, they do influence um, players and yeah. Um, influence players and sometimes players try to come in thinking they can do something that's um, and it's not always within the rules uh, yeah so let's let's get sorted on that let's see I gotta I'm gonna move myself all the way down here hello it is I um, we'll probably watch some D&D &D meme stuff too to like um, you know break up the monotony of like rule checking and stuff like that uh, but yeah, nothing else to do but to get started. Oh, by the way, do you like my pretty background? I think I like it a lot. It makes me very happy. This is the um, Mythic Athenium, which is uh, my official residence within the lore. I plan on to get to better art at some point, but this is a nice little, a nice little placeholder. Nice and purple. I like the purple here. Um, all right. Switch is over. Look at that. There, here I am. It's all pretty. Yeah, so we've got our D&D builds. Um, we have a few play tests from a couple of creators. Uh, looks like this D&D &D Daily Guy updates pretty recently. Um, flavor builds is what he has. I don't know if we want to do flavor builds. Uh, oh, this guy. I have a subscribe to this guy. Let's, yeah, let's check out... Actually, yeah, I will. Let's do D4, D&D &D Deep Dive. Hello, you lovely oh person. Welcome to D4. Hello. Yes, hello. Sorry, I'm going to jump to a playlist real quick. Ranking My Build 2023. Pathfinder, Baldur's Gate 3, Slide Into... I don't know what that means. D&D &D Optimized. Oh, this is a podcast. Wait, where is it? where are his builds? Okay, I guess we'll just scroll through. Maybe I should have gone through something a little bit better. Ooh, Crit Fisher. Crit Fisher might be good. Let's see. Let's, see. Let's pull up some Crit Fisher. What is the highest percent chance to get a critical hit on a single attack that a character can have in D&D &D 5e without magic items? I'm not talking about things that guarantee a critical hit, like attacking a paralyzed or unconscious creature, or getting surprise on an enemy if you're an assassin rogue, right? I'm talking about more run-of-the-mill stuff that doesn't require any, this might not work, preconditions to be met. The answer is 27.1%. You wanna see how to try to get the That's most out of having that fantastic crit chance? Then keep watching. Welcome to D4. Welcome to D4, thank you. Yeah, but this guy is D4 D&D &D Deep Guy. Keep that in mind. Hey, everybody. So here at D4, each week I take a deep dive into one, usually, sometimes more, uh, character builds for my up. favorite Sorry about that. games. I like to crunch numbers about them, theorycraft about them, uh, not so that I can tell you the right way or the best way to play a certain character, but to explore one potential way to build something in the hopes of creating a character that's both really powerful but also really fun to play. So if you enjoy creating characters for your favorite role-playing games almost as much as you enjoy right, playing on, the actual get to the game point. itself, or if what you're just looking for tips or ideas on how to build something that you're thinking about playing, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and I'm so glad you're here. So thank you for watching. My name's Colby, and yes, Hi, Colby. I have a man bun, and I'm not taking it out. <laughs>
<laughs> I like your man bun. Just give me Colby. one, just one video with the man bun. That's all I ask. Okay. I've got a lot of things on my mind to share with today's build, so let's just jump right in. First, let's jump right in. I've let's do it. I've been thinking a lot about crit fishing lately. A long time ago, I did a crit fisher build. Uh, check it out right up there. A character who was trying to, you know, fish for crits, get a really high crit chance, and then when they did get a critical hit, unload with some big damage. I think it worked really well, but one <laughs> comment that I got unload. a ton of on that video was essentially real crit fishers use elven accuracy. And. Don't get True. me wrong, I get it. Elven accuracy, powerful feat. Anyone who's been watching this channel... Elven accuracy is the only feat in the game that allows for super advantage. Otherwise, it's not typically allowed unless your DM is very fun. Um, like me, I technically allow super advantage. I give my players um, inspiration, like a pool of inspiration. Um, you can earn up to a max of three inspiration points. I know that's not like typical or anything like that, but that's how I run my games. And um, you could use one of them to like re-roll your stuff. Uh, and if you have a three, you can cash in all three of them uh, for an automatic natural twenty. Just kind of like a fun little thing um, to allow players to you know be heroes and uh, make them a little bit better at doing what they do. Because sometimes, sometimes the dice don't allow you to tell the story that you want to tell with your um, character. So yeah, I make sure that. Um, uh, yeah, I try to give them a little bit, a little bit of a boost, a little bit of a boost, one might say. Um, not that they really need it. Sometimes I think it's kind of an overpowered system that I've put into place into my own games, but uh, it doesn't matter because they think it's fun. Um, I also give, uh, in, I, um, oh, I reward inspirations by, uh, oh God, what was the method? Um, you make me laugh. Sometimes I'll give you an inspiration. Uh, if you play two to your character, even though it results into a negative outcome, I give an inspiration for that. I also give it an inspiration for honesty. Um, for example, if you made a roll or did an ability and you realized you couldn't do it anymore, even though we might have to like retcon something in like combat or otherwise, um, I'll give an inspiration for it because I do appreciate honesty. And also I give um, three inspiration points for like your birthday um, or my birthday. I'll give everybody inspiration for my birthdays. Um, but that hasn't quite come up yet. Uh, but anyway, let's get into this. Well, for any length of time knows how I feel about it. But yeah, especially if you're crit fishing, because getting to roll three d20s to hit when you have advantage instead of two is a really nice increase to our chance to get a critical hit, right? If you have advantage yep. on your attacks, elven accuracy brings your crit chance to just over 14%. If you are critting on a 19 or a 20, though, plus elven accuracy, that's how you get to that magic 27% number. The big 27%. problem with elven accuracy in a, that's crit a lot of critting is that you only get that triple advantage or super advantage three rolls, right? If you're using charisma, wisdom, intelligence, or dexterity for your attack. I mean, I guess in that in another... Mm, charisma, wisdom, and dexterity. Let's rule check him real quick. I think he's correct, but wisdom part sounds a little odd. So I'm going to check on that wisdom thing. Elven accuracy from Xanathar's Guide to everything. Oh, I guess that video disappears. Hold on. Uh, I'll fix that. All right. Um, hopefully it'll be back. Uh, let's see. Accuracy of elves is legendary, especially that of elf archers and spell casters. You have uncanny aim with attacks that rely on precision rather than brute force. You gain the following benefits. Increase your dexterity, intelligence, wisdom, or charisma. Whenever you have advantage on attack or using dexterity, intelligence, wisdom, or charisma, you may re-roll. Nope, he's correct. Following the rules so far, this guy knows his stuff. Play. Of itself isn't a problem, but what is a problem is that the easiest way to get advantage in game right now, which you have to have in order to benefit from elven accuracy in the first place, that you know that just kind of works all the time whenever you want it, is the barbarian's reckless attack. And you can only take advantage of reckless attack if you are using strength for your attacks. So just doesn't really play Correct. nice with elven accuracy. There are other ways to get advantage in the game, of course, plenty, but the vast majority of them rely on you doing something first and often have a chance of failing. The I'm actually suspicious that one of my players um, uses has used one of this build in a couple of my one shots. I think I know exactly where this is going. Fairy fire spell, knocking your enemy prone, the old darkness devil sight thing. These are all great, but darkness sometimes an devil enemy side. will make a save against them, or they can be a nuisance on the battlefield, or perhaps most damningly, they take a round to set up. When have you ever cared about setup rounds? My critics may ask. And you know what? Yeah, 
they have a right to ask because I'm kind of notorious for building characters who can do a boatload of damage if everything, if everything works, everything just, works right. just right. Yep, yep, yep. If everything works just right. Um, I have a couple of builds like that. So like uh, my glass cannon, I, I don't really call it a glass cannon. It's more like my burst uh, boss killer build, um, which is Divine Soul Sorcerer and Paladin. Uh, essentially, the idea is that um, it only really takes like a round to set up, actually. Like you uh, cast Spirit Guardians the second that you get in. Um, and then on the next turn, you approach um, said boss enemy or something like that. You quick and cast lightning bolt, and then you unleash two smites, and you kind of like rinse and repeat that until you have bursted the boss down. Um, that's how that's how she works. Um, it is reliant on spirit guardians. Um, I mean, it depends what kind of um, spirit guardians, uh, I guess, is being run for your campaign, because uh, some DMs don't always run it as like it's kind of like a drive by kind of effect. Um, like what I mean by like drive by spirit guardians is that, um, when you like it reads in such a funny way, it's kind of, it's a weird, it's a weirdly written spell, but it reads in a way that it suggests that when an enemy first enters the space of spirit guardians, that that mean uh, on a turn, that means just like, as you approach them, it does damage as soon as they come within the space. Um, but Jeremy Crawford, it says like, no, blah, blah, blah. And he has his ruling for that. And I say that that is the non fun way to run it. Um, because, you know, it doesn't deal as much damage to run it the um, the non-drive-by way. So we like drive-by spirit guardians in this house. It's a lot of fun. But anyway, um, when everything's said and done, including crits and stuff like that, um, my uh, paladin burster can deal... Oh, the last time I did the math is... I know it's over 100 points of damage in a single turn, uh, and that's without crits and stuff like that. And it's, um, yeah, it just gets worse. Like the higher that that burst build um, gets, um, the uh, more damage it deals. Um, actually, I think I might have, I might have, hold on. We'll go to DB, D &D Beyond real quick. I know that I'm detracting ever so slightly. Um, hold on. Chill in. Mimis. I'm just gonna upgrade the update the title real quick. There we go. Updates ever boy. Um okay, so where is she? I know that okay, yeah, so I made Pandora. Yeah, Pandora. This is the this is the this is my paladin burster. Um this is my very paladin burster. Very powerful paladin burster. Good lord. Um you think I'd be able to talk better with how much like DMing and stuff that I do. Um, okay, so best part about this build, um, yeah, we're getting way off base, but I'm very proud of this build. I like this build a lot, uh, so that's why we're getting um, we're getting very off track. Uh, so uh, you, so the first thing you do is you go all the way up to Paladin Five to get your two attacks. Um, so and then like you're like you're still pretty powerful too. Like that's the best part about this build is that even though it is a multi class you are still pretty good through like the er the early game because sometimes what happens with multi-classes is that they can be pretty weak at a certain point but with as a paladin and you reach level five like you're still powerful you still have your two hits you still have your spell smites um and all that kind of stuff you can go up to six if you want to get um our protection as quickly as possible i kind of do recommend it because it does boost your saving throws to just something absolutely ridiculous um, that's why I call this the burster. It's not like, it's not like really a tank or even like a glass cannon because you can have super high AC and your saving throws can be absolutely insane. So it's, it's definitely a burster essentially. Uh, but anyway, you go all the way up to, um, Paladin six, uh, you take dueling to get that extra little two points of damage on your hits. Um, I like to go with, um, technically the... Um, the Oath of Redemption isn't the best one, but I picked Oath of Redemption just because of its uh, Reaction Channel Divinity. Its Reaction Channel Divinity allows you to uh, make a target do a saving throw and like take the damage that the same damage it just dealt. So like if a boss monster crits on one of your um, uh, on one of your friends and does an intense amount of damage, you can essentially say no you and slap that damage back onto them if they fail the wisdom saving throw half damage if they don't and it's really good um again kind of like increasing that burst essentially and then if you get an amulet of the devout you get two of them so you can so the burst damage goes even higher uh you might do like pa uh, vengeance paladin vengeance paladin is something i thought about and it's pretty decent um for that advantage 
that Channel Divinity you need to get advantage on the target or whatever, but I still think as far as burst wise, that um Rebuke the Violent just has uh just such a massive capability of adding an absolute shit ton of damage on top of everything else that you're already doing. Um so anyway, so this is um so you're you're gonna be pretty boring. You're not gonna be super bursty. I mean you're gonna be paladin bursty, of course, um, but you're not gonna be super bursty in the beginning. Um, but as soon as you hit uh, level 7 and you can start getting into Sorcerer, but uh, it's really when you get to level 10 and 11 that this build really starts to just absolutely slap. Um, and that is because you can take, you get your meta magics, and in addition to that, you get um, your third level uh, spells, uh, which is like Lightning Bolt and Fireball and stuff like that. Now, I do uh, Lightning Bolt because of the accuracy, less chance of hitting one of your friends. And, um, uh, you know, you can use it in like tight spaces and stuff like that without uh, destroying like a bunch of shit. Um, and uh, rather than doing fireball, I also do lightning bolt because lightning bolt is a damage type that's not um, resisted as often. Um, fireball is resisted much more often because demons are immune to it. Um, demons are either immune or resistant to it. Devils are just flat out immune to it most of the time. Um, then you have elementals, like there's a lot of fire elementals that are obviously going to be immune to it or even heal from uh, fire damage. And like the list just goes on, like there's a bunch of stuff that's resistant to fire damage, but not as much is resistant to lightning damage. Plus lightning da lightning is just cooler, like shooting lightning bolts out of your hand uh, fucking slaps. Uh, not only that, but you finally get um, spirit guardians, and that's when you can pop that 3d8 radiant damage or that 3d8 necrotic damage, which turns into a 68 um but anyway i can go over that later uh we should probably we should probably get back to the video a eh? but that's why you do divine soul sorcerer play right and if you take around to set it all up etc to be fair not all of my nova or burst damage builds work this way but a lot of them do and in See, those instances nova build. i'll usually nova burst builds they're super type. fun and while i have done plenty of builds that are meant to just do big damage right on round one like uh, the supernova moon to name one but yeah my friend uh kobold pack tactics put out a video recently about the value of burst damage early in a fight it's a great vid check it out here if you haven't seen it and it's had me thinking a lot lately about how important early damage that, really actually. is. That's not to say that there aren't times when going Nova later in a fight is a bad idea. Maybe you're a melee character and you can't get in range of the enemies on round one. Maybe you start a fight thinking it'll be a breeze and you didn't want to blow all of your resources, but the enemies are tougher than you thought and now it's time to put the smack down. Maybe you thought you killed the big bad, but then they take on their final form. I don't know. But regardless, yes, generally speaking, it's tactically sound if you're going to burst, to burst right away if possible so you can hopefully take out an enemy or maybe two before they get a chance to go, making the rest of the fight a lot easier for your entire party, right? Hell so yeah, when I was brother. thinking about how to build an elven accuracy crit fisher, I decided that I was going to commit to building one that was going Nova right on round one. Finally, after putting out my best builds for every level video a couple of weeks ago, it's actually today as I'm recording this, um, but yeah, check that out here if you haven't seen it. I was really proud of that one. Anyways, since then, we should I've probably also check been that out. thinking a lot about the value of builds that just work. Sure, it can be fun to put something together. Okay, this is like, a... hey, if all the cards fall into place and just the right way. Long... If Ooh, you're what's interested this art? in following him on social media to check out the other stuff he's done or to potentially. Sorry, I'm going to okay, skip ahead. got my character, uh, the version of them when they change. Okay. Level one for our starting class. We're gonna skip ahead. The thing. <laughs> He's getting too long to get to the point. I say that after saying, "Here's our starting class." Uh, I want rogue levels later for this build, much later actually. But for me, rogue, rogue levels are good. is one of those classes where if you're gonna take some at some point, unless there's a good reason for starting with something else, I really like to start with rogue. Since starting at rogue one it gives you most of what you need to be a pretty effective scout and lock picker for your party if you want or need to fill that role. You get more proficiencies starting as rogue, thieves tools, proficiency, expertise. You're a pretty decent. A bonus to picking rogue as well is that you'll not you'll not only be viable in combat, but you'll also be like a little bit of a skill monkey when you get outside of combat. Um, so rogue is just an amazing dip for any kind of maze multi-class to add that little bit of like flavor. Like if there's like some downtime, the DM's like, hey, you level up and stuff like that. Like, okay, you, you like during that time, like I really got good at like lock picking and stuff like that, which is, you know, for your expertise and um, that a added expertise is just um, absolutely fucking uh, necessary sometimes, especially if you want to be really, really good at something. Skill monkey, even if you don't put any more levels here for a while, 
So yeah, assuming that you want to go that route as much as I do, let's start here, meaning that when we first meet our champion, they are something of a scoundrel. But I envision this character as being a very driven scoundrel. They are disciplined and rigorous in their training in the arts of subterfuge, demanding perfection of themselves and maybe even those they run with. They might even be like a thieves guild or assassins guild leader, I think. As for our race, well, I've already said that we want elven accuracy, so that means we're going either half elf or full elf, right? Or, or you know, maybe an Eladrin or a Shadar Kai, those count as elves too. So and I had to switch it to I 1080. Always be a little more 720 was bothering myself, me. Since they get better starting ability scores, but I wouldn't consider it mandatory necessarily. I'm going to assume we're going half elf. As for which sub race of half elf to choose, just pick your favorite. I tend to prefer drow half. Uh, let's see, half elf as a choice. That is an interesting choice. I know they're trying to go for elven accuracy, but why half elf? Um, I don't think they get to anything, anything too great. See, I would have gone with like a ladrin or something like that, so you can get that extra teleport. And I believe even like the teleport has some um nice uh, damage on a couple of them. Um, so why would you do? Why was he picking half elf? um skill versatility oh i guess that proficiency and a couple extra skills if you want to be that skill monkey oh he did mention that like a little bit of skill monkey stuff kind of goes into it oh uh, you get your dark vision and stuff like that um but the prob of the see the thing is though is if you go a ladron a ladron gives you that face step now and you're and you can change your um uh you can change your like uh your your season essentially whenever you want uh like when you teleport after you after you teleport in the autumn uh, you can make creatures do a wisdom save or be charmed. If you change your um, season to winter, uh, they can be frightened after they fail a wisdom save after you teleport. Um, and spring is that you can touch one killing creature and, oh, you can transfer your teleport to somebody else if you do spring. And then summer is immediately after you use your face step, each creature of your choice they can see within five feet of you takes fire damage equal to your proficiency bonus. See, that's why I would have gone with Eladrin is because you can add a little bit of extra damage on it, not to mention you get a free proficiency in the perception skill, uh, which is extremely handy. Everybody likes a perceptive um, character. Half-elf for the spells or wood half-elf for more move speed, but nothing's going to be super imperative to the build. For our ability scores, I'm assuming point by as always and say let's go with a 15 dexterity, take a plus two there. A 13 constitution plus one, a 13 charisma plus one, and then a 13 strength. Yeah, we're going to be pretty mad, multiple ability score dependent, but thanks to Half Elf, we do have an easier time dealing with that. Oh, and by the way, you could get that. In my games, we roll for stats, and I'm really generous. Like, I allow them to roll um, three different groups of arrays, essentially, and they can pick from the array that they like the most. This usually results in characters that are pretty powerful. Uh, like, it's pretty rare for one of uh, my player characters to not have a 20 in at least one stat. Um, and honestly, like, there's a lot of DMs that are like, oh, this is so stupid powerful. But, like, the thing is, is you can, um, like, you can ruin your like, player character's day whenever you want. Um, so having them be super powerful really is not an issue. And in fact, I think what a lot of DMs forget is that, like, the more powerful your player characters are the cooler monsters that you can use. Like you can go to the um, CR20s and stuff like that and you don't have to shy away from them and um, shy away from them if your party is incredibly powerful uh, because they'll be able to take it on and you'll be able to be able to use a cool monster. Um, like one of my monsters here, I am going to do, I am going to show off a little bit. We're going to show off. You can find these on the uh, Patreon, um, but this is a bunch of stuff that I've been making for the Patreon. Um, and um, I think one of my favorites so far is Gloomblade Grudge is pretty... Yeah, I'll show the, off the gr Gloomblade Grudge. Let's show off the Gloomblade Grudge. Why don't we? Beautiful. All right, so this is a monster that is incredibly powerful. And the idea behind this monster is what if a rogue had legendary actions? And um, what if it had copies of itself, essentially? Kind of like a um, Echo Knight. Um, so, so really hard hitting, doesn't have a lot of hit points though. Um, it's meant for characters that are level uh, 11 and, um, uh, level 11 and plus. Um, and you get the whole sneak attack and stuff like that. You get evasion. Um, I added something called elusive form, which is attacks on the grudge cannot be made with advantage as long as the grudge isn't incapacitated. So essentially it gives him immunity to advantage and this, and I added that in because I just, I just really liked the idea of that. Uh, and the funniest bit about this is like elven accuracy wouldn't exactly apply to him 
uh, which is absolutely hilarious. So like you couldn't do your like crit fishing bill. Now I know that like sometimes, you know, some DMs will be like, Ooh, why would you crush down somebody that, um, you know, build specific. The thing is, is if you build into one thing and you don't know how to like improvise when uh, said thing, like, um, really like goes against your build. Um, you, you know, you're, you're not as good of a player at the end of the day. Um, and this, and, and like, because he has such low hit points, um, it's nice to be able to give him that more like evasive. Plus it's really good flavor. Like you, like that's so much flavor that DMs could add to that. Like of why he has this elusive form and why you can't like get advantage against him. That's super fun. And then, um, I had an ability that I call uncanny awareness, uh, which gives him plus 10, 10 bonus to his initiative rolls. Um, he has a couple of Gloom Edge attacks, uh, plus 11 to hit, which is pretty standard at that level, nothing too special, 2d8 plus 6 necrotic damage. Now that, that hits pretty hard, but that's what we want our, um, we want our uh, guy to hit pretty hard. And in, in addition to that, when the Grudge attacks a target which is in dim light or darkness, they can make the attack with advantage. And that is where the um, different sneak, stat and sneak attack stuff starts coming into play. Uh, Gloom Age, there is a ranged version of it, and there's a melee version of it. The ranged version has a 40 feet um, with an 80 foot long, and then it still does the same damage and still has the same ability. Um, now, another thing about this um, creature, why it's so powerful, is I also imagined, um, I also created it because I wanted it to be a uh, mage killer, essentially. I wanted it to have the ability, essentially, story-wise, to be able to kill mages by himself. So that um, he like assassinate like super powerful mages and high um, you know high levels and stations and stuff like that by by itself is the is the other idea behind this. Um, so Dark Haven, uh, he's able to teleport within to an un unoccupied space within sixty feet as long as it's in, within dim light or darkness. And then Hush now is the Grudge magically manifests an aura of pure silence to extend from them in a forty foot radius sphere for one minute. Basically, it is the silence spell, but it's as an aura. And um, it can be dispelled, which is why I put magically in there. Um, that's something that you can dispel, but, uh, and he can do it once per short rest. So like if it gets dispelled, it, um, it this encourages like hit and run tactics. Like if you're trying to, um, like as a DM, if you're trying to take out uh, like a leader of a city or something like that, um, like silently and quietly and quickly and by himself, but he like gets interrupted, like the adventures show up and they cast dispel magic on the hush now or whatever. Um, that like encourages you as the DM be like, okay, he's got to get out there. He can no longer do this quietly. So this is over. Uh, the one after that is devouring gloom, uh, which is the grudge targets a creature within five feet and forces it to make a charisma save on a failure, the target creature and the grudge vanish through a rift of pure darkness and appear within the shadow fell. He can literally take you to a different plane of existence. It's like, it's like he banishes the both of you to a plane where he is going to be, uh, where his abilities dominate within that space. Um, and the, if he also has Hush now, not only that, not only are you going to be on a different plane, but it's also going to be eerily quiet. Um, but this one, you know, only once per long rest. So you want to be, um, so you don't really get uh, get to use that too much. Um, but the Coupled Shadows, this is, this he can use this as much as you want. He always gets his copies, um, just like the Echo Knight does. And the Grudge creates up to three perfect copies of itself. These copies are considered objects. And while these copies exist, the Grudge can, Choose if one of its attacks originate from the copy space. Now, the important thing about this, um, and I'm just going to flex my knowledge of the rules, essentially, is that there are a lot of spells in the game that DMs forget about that cannot target objects. Uh, they can only target creatures, as it says in their spell list. That's how spells work, is they can only affect um, organic beings, uh, which says a lot about the um, creation of magic. Um, but in any case... Um, so you could like these like these these copies are essentially immune to things like lightning bolt and fireball and stuff like that. They're immune to they're mere, they're nearly immune to magical damage. So you can't just slap a fireball down and, and delete all of his copies. Um, uh, they're a lot more difficult. Uh, they only have one hit point, uh, but he can manifest them once again. Um, so it's all uh, the, so like the whole idea is also like you have to find like he's very evasive, so you have to find like the right one. Um, and then we gave him Eye for Weakness, which is a bonus action. This makes him also incredibly powerful, um, which he makes a insight check against a creature's deception check, and on a success, he can mix the next attack on the creature with advantage. So even if um, his target is not within dim light, or um, dim light or darkness, he can still roll to be able to gain his advantage, so he, he, so he always has his sneak attack going. And then, of course, when it comes to um, legendary actions, we give him an attack one, of course. Um, so he can get that sneak attack off. 
um, as, uh, you know, outside of his turn, which is super nasty. He can use an eye for weakness um, in case he's not, you know, they, they're cast daylight, daylight or something like that, and he doesn't have any shadows to teleport to. Uh, and then, of course, he can just um, he can just use Dark Haven um, with three actions to be super evasive if he needs to be. Uh, one of the changes I did make is um, Sneak Attack, which is he can do an extra 48. Now, a lot of people will be like, isn't it 46 or whatever? I changed it to 48, uh, mostly as a ease of use thing for DMs uh, when they run this thing, because I one of the super annoying things for me is um, picking up a monster that uh, forces me to like grab a bunch of different dice. Uh, this way, all you have to do is have your D8s ready um, to you know slap players around, and it's um, it's a lot easier to roll and a lot easier to manage. Uh, but yeah, that's the Gloomblade Grudge. So um, yeah, if you if you want to have this actual PDF, you can go to the Patreon and stuff like that, subscribe, and you can download this PDF, uh, and you can use them. Oh, and of course, if the grudge hits with an attack of opportunity, the target's movement speed is reduced to zero. Super nasty. He is really nasty. Um, I haven't uh, ran him yet, but I'm super excited to. I don't think he's super broken or anything like that, um, but I will, I'll find out at some point. Um, he's meant to be nasty, so um, I hope you have powerful player characters if you throw him, if you throw him at them. Uh, but anyway, back to the video. Strength to a 14 if you really wanted. We needed at least a 13 for multi-classing, but I think I just as soon put my wisdom at a 10, personally. So anyways, do what you want there. As for our equipment uh, starting off, I'm going to say let's go gold buy, grab some studded leather, a rapier, and a shield. Though we're not proficient in shields just yet. As a rogue one, rogue one. Then we get thieves cant, which is the special <laughs> coded language that thieves can use to send messages to one another uh, in a kind of hidden way, right? Then we get expertise, which lets us double our proficiency bonus with uh, either two skills that we're proficient in, love or one expertise, skill, and then thieves tools, right? I'm gonna say let's go stealth or thieves tools but if you aren't really planning on filling the sneaky scouty role for your party feel free to go perception instead or something else in fact i might actually take perception over one of those other two anyways since our wisdom score is going to be so low and you need perception not just to you know <laughs> perceive things but it also helps to detect traps and find hidden doors right perception is the most used skill in D. &D. you literally cannot avoid it um, so like it's it's a, it's almost a requirement essentially to have somebody that is really good at perception in your party and it's always super fun to be that person who has really high perception it's also fun to not have super high perception in um in uh, some players defenses because sometimes uh, because then you can allow yourself to just you know walk into the traps and that can be its own fun so worth considering as a rogue one we also get sneak attack, which tells us that once per turn, if we have advantage on the attack or are attacking someone standing next to our ally, we can add a d6 of damage to a hit so long as we're using either a ranged or finesse weapon. And yes, damage from sneak attack doubles on a crit. Nice. Before moving on, let me just give a quick shout out and thank you to my channel members. You guys are so awesome. I could not do this without you. I really appreciate your support. And if you're not a channel member, I'd appreciate it if you'd consider joining. There's a little button down there. It says join. Click it and it'll tell you the benefits that you can get by being a member. It's not very expensive. You can get access to the library of write-ups that I create for each of these builds to help you recreate it yourself a little more easily access to the d4 discord server filled with wonderful lovely people and even access to our monthly live q a hangout sessions if you that's want to consider it awesome if you don't that's okay too i appreciate you just being here liking subscribing especially clicking the notifications bell commenting these are all great ways to support the channel too so thank you for that too okay at level two with our roguish foundation secured uh, i want to start multi-classing and there's going to be a lot of that going on with this build for me I think my character or I was going to say it says levels two to six. I was going to say multi-classing at level two is um, pretty intense. I don't know if I would uh, if I would do that necessarily at two. I'd get a little bit of get some few D sixes under your belt as a rogue first. Um, so you're not super weak in the beginning, because if you multi-class too soon, like I stated earlier, um, you're not as you're not as powerful and you can be a little bit of a liability to the rest of your party if you're too weak in the beginning someone they care for here maybe has been slighted or affronted or wounded or maybe even killed but the one who has wronged us is a lot more powerful than we are at the moment for whatever reason they're a little bit untouchable right now so we decide to dedicate ourselves to the cause of vengeance swearing an oath to get even eventually doubling down on okay i know where this build is going yeah 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 i know where this build is going 
Um, he's doing the whole rogue, stack D6s, and then smite, stack the D8s, and just really crit fishing for that ultimate kind of breakdown of burst damage. It's it's pretty good. It's a pretty solid build. Um, I think I like my only kind of issue with it is that your 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 rogue damage will always be always be super low, and and your smites like you won't have a lot of smites. Like that'll be the biggest issue because like talons run out of smites really really fast. Um, there's ways to mitigate this, which is why I think that my burst build is a little bit better. Um, because if you take the levels in Sorcerer, and more levels you get, more spell slots you get, and therefore the more smites that you can do. Um, the only thing that like that build doesn't do is it doesn't necessarily crit fish, um, which I guess there is a, is a way to do. If, like, if your campaign goes up to a high enough level, you could just dip a, into Champion uh, real quick, and then maybe you could pick up um, Elven Accuracy. Um, but you would have to use like a rapier instead of a longsword. You wouldn't be strength based or anything like that again, uh, which could, you know, potentially harm your ability to wear the heavier armors. Um, but yeah, I already see where this build is coming. Um, but this guy's pretty good. I don't know if we're, I don't know if we're going to catch him on any rules slips on our discipline and devotion to becoming the most deadly, maybe anti-hero we can possibly become. Whatever your reasons, we are taking, yes, paladin levels now. Wait, a dex-based pally? That's right. And yeah. It's not even my dex first, actually. Dex-based dex paladins are fucking great. Um, they have super high initiative. Uh, they can have a really good AC if you build them right. And um, yeah, they're great. They're fucking great. So as a pally one, we get a couple of features. The best one is lay on hands, which gives us five lay on hands points per paladin level. That we can use with an action and a touch to either heal one hit point per point spent or cure a disease or a poison for the cost of five points. Super efficient, super useful, scales nicely, uh, they reset on a long rest. Divine Sense, the other feature we get here, a little bit less impressive I think, it just lets us detect the presence of undead fiends or celestials within 60 feet of us, not behind total cover. Once in a while, you'll be glad you have it. At level three, we would be a paladin two, and that means we get a fighting style, and we are going with dueling here. It says that when we make an attack, with a one-handed weapon and have no weapon in our other hand dueling is great i think i also have a build that i made at one point that um stacks uh just flat damage so like its goal is to just deal a bunch of flat damage not like trying to stack like multiple uh, multiple dice just doing flat damage um which really kind of like if you're running like if like your dm's running a lower magic campaign and you're only getting um like uh, access to like plus two swords and stuff like that it's a build that I highly recommend because you can actually get your flat damage high, pretty high, pretty quickly. Um, like I think, I think even by like level eight or so, you can get your flat damage um, increased all the way up to like plus ten or something to that effect if you build it right. And I tell you what, like rolling a d10 plus plus ten is 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 fantastic, and it's a really way to just guarantee how much damage you're going to do rather than having to well gamble for the amount of damage that you're going to do we can do an extra two damage alas that does not double on a crit but we'll take it and i like the idea of a light armor wearing rapier and shield using paladin here which yeah, i didn't mention that i guess we get shield proficiency when we take paladin levels right and Correct. it's a bit of a unique take on the class and i'm here for it the thing that i'm mostly here for though is of course divine smite which says that when we hit an enemy with a melee attack slots are for smites never forget it slots are always for smites Attack, we can spend a spell slot to do 2d8 additional radiant damage plus 1d8 more for every spell slot above first that we spend capping at 5d8 or fourth level spell slots this is the real thing that we will be using to blow up our enemies on a crit and it's gonna be spectacular eventually we also get again the only issue here is that you don't get access to fourth level slots especially if you multi-class into a much 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 higher level um like if i want to do a rules check real quick do 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 do. Uh, do, do, do. We're gonna go into classes. Slap that paladin up. Um, yeah. So you don't get fourth level spell slots as a paladin all the way up until level thirteen. Um, that's when you'll be actually be able to do your max damage as a paladin. Now you get them a lot quicker if you do a multi-class. So if you do paladin sorcerer, like I like to do, or pal no, mainly paladin sorcerer, you can um, you can get access to those fourth level spell slots a, a lot quicker. Weirdly enough, um, and another thing you have to keep in mind, um, which is why this build might not be too viable, um, it, depending on the campaign, is that most campaigns end at the eleventh or twelfth level because anything past that and the 
characters are super fucking powerful and it's really hard to challenge them in and outside of combat and things just things start turning into more anime-esque kind of fights and um like role plays rather than like these kind of more grounded like uh you know low magic kind of story stuff it really you really start bump running into the anime fights and that sort of thing um but yeah let's keep Keep seeing what he's got. Spells at Paladin 2 here, and because we are going to be so focused on burst damage, this character's sustained damage isn't going to be quite as amazing, right? So if it were me, I'd probably focus on taking spells here that will bring some nice utility or support. Bless is for sure a go-to here, adding a d4 to the attack rolls we and love saving bless. throws of multiple party members. So good. And then Only problem with Bless is it is concentration. I would honestly argue that you wouldn't really don't bless really does not need to be a concentration spell in my opinion. Like it really doesn't need to be. I don't know if they're going to fix that with D&D 2024 or whatever with the new books coming out, but it is one of those spells where it it really shouldn't have been concentration. Then sure cure wounds for a backup heal option because like it falls off like the the boost kind of falls off in later levels. Like either your characters have such a um massive increase to their ability to hit and like their uh, you know and all that kind of stuff and their saving throws they don't really need it anymore or um like your concentration is just constantly get, getting broken and there's just there's just better spells that you could be concentrating on other than bless um so bless like really kind of loses its viability super uh super early on if you're out of lay on hands points right at level four we would be a paladin three and that means we get divine health which makes us immune to all disease super handy if Hardly it ever comes, comes up in game otherwise won't be that useful but that's okay because we also at pally three get our sacred oath our paladin subclass and we are going in case you couldn't tell with my little backstory with oath of vengeance this is such a great subclass one of my favorites especially for burst damage purposes as a vengeance pally we get a couple of new spells here uh bane and hunter's mark neither of which we'll plan on using during our nova round but might be worth using sometimes outside of that I actually find that strange because Hunter's Mark actually adds a D6 of your weapon damage um, on a hit. Uh, its downside is that it is concentration. Again, another spell that doesn't really, like, in my opinion, like, when you're a player, I think some of the spells, when you're a player character, like, as you get into a higher level, I think, like, some lower level spells, like, their concentration should just be ignored. Like, there's something, like, when it comes to a caster or whatever, like, when you get to this level this list of spells or whatever no longer require concentration. Like Hunter's Mark should have been one of those. Um, Bless should be one of those. I just think it would make them a lot more viable. Now you can't have a DM that can come in and like make you um, a magic item that allows you to cast Bless without the need for concentration. And I would say that those are very nice DMs. Um, those are something that I like to do. I like to remove concentration because there's too many concentration spells in the game, man. And ultimately, it doesn't matter. So I won't complain about them. Then all paladins get channel divinity here, which just like for clerics, we can use once per short rest. Now, every paladin can use it for harness divine power, letting us recover a spent spell slot once per day as a bonus action, the spell level of which is equal to half our proficiency bonus rounded up. But then as a vengeance pally, we can use it for one of two additional things. Abjure enemy lets us attempt to frighten an enemy for one minute if they fail their Black. wisdom save against it. And if they do, they're not only frightened, but also can't move, though both of those effects end if they take damage. Uh, even if they succeed, though, their speed is still halved, so at least you get something in that case. The real gem here, of course, is Vow of Enmity, Vow of which enmity. lets us, with a bonus so action, good. have advantage on attacks against a single enemy for one minute or until they're dead or unconscious. I really love this ability on this character, since, again, it just gives us advantage right on round one if we want it, no questions asked. And that is what we're building for. At level five, we would be a Paladin 4. That means we get our first ability score of increase or feat. And yes, of course, we, we are going to take Elven Accuracy. Probably my favorite feat in all of 5e. This raises our dexterity. Yeah, it's your favorite feat because it's the most meta feat to take. So the, like kind of my only issue with Elven Accuracy is that, especially when it comes to these videos, is it like it definitely turns into just like a meta build thing. Um, like I can't count the amount of times that somebody has come into a one shot with Elven Accuracy. Like they, like people just can't help themselves. And, and another thing that's really funny about Elven Accuracy is like the players that bring it sometimes get what I call the Elven Accuracy curse, which is like they'll bring it with the intention to be able to hit a lot or even crit fish, but they won't ever roll a crit or they ever won't ever roll high enough to like hit things. Like the dice really can just like look at your meta build and just not give a shit about your meta build. 
um and you just you know you just turn into uh you just turn into this like useless meta build which is just hilarious parity for us by one to a nice even 18 and then tells us that if we make an attack with dexterity or wisdom or intelligence or charisma and have advantage then we can roll three d20s to try and hit instead of two putting us at a lovely 14.26 percent chance to crit now when we have advantage anyways and that is fantastic at level six we would be a paladin five and that means we get extra attack so that we can attack twice when we take the attack action on our turn leading to more chances to crit and smite our foes right out of the gate. And we also get second level spells here and sticking with the like support and utility theme, let's grab aid to buff maximum hit points and heal also. A lesser restoration for a little cure all. And then, I mean, yeah, we're paladin. We kind of have to take fine steed, right? Of course we don't really have to, but- Nope, slots for smites. It would be silly not to, I think. It lets us summon a war horse or something else less mechanically good if you really want and that warhorse will just stay with us forever until it gets reduced to zero hit points or we dismiss it now the question i always ask with this spell is should we count it towards the damage calculations and the answer is usually sure i know the rules for mounted combat in 5e are super wonky but the vast majority of tables so far as i can tell let you both decide where the steed goes and let it make attacks against you when you want to attack regardless of the whole are they an independent or mount or are they controlled mount shenanigans right the spell description says you can communicate telepathically and that you fight as a seamless unit that's good enough for me and apparently most of you as well if you don't want to count the steed's yep. damage that's fine it's not a huge amount it'll be like 10 ish points of damage depending on the enemy armor class there i would count that 10 points of damage can make all the difference especially if you get multiple hits in because that 10 turns into 20 and then it turns into 30 and then it turns into 40 and then it turns into 50 like you get what i'm saying they're not going to have advantage they're not smiting it's just a little bump speaking of though at level six it is time for our first damage report so what does combat look like for us right now it's fairly simple we charge into battle on our trusty steed, put Vow of Enmity on our target, and smite them twice with a couple of rapier attacks, using both of our second level spell slots, potentially, for 3d8 each, applying the extra d6 from sneak attack on our first hit. Now, if you are truly crit fishing, you this might want to just rules. hold off on smite and sneak attack until you crit, right? Our chance to crit on a single hit is 14%, like I've said, but our chance on landing at least one critical hit on our turn, since we're making two attacks, is over 26%. Not bad. Of course, we've only got guaranteed advantage on a single enemy per short rest, right? With Vow of Enmity. You don't get to transfer it or anything once your target's dead. So nope. you might just want to smite away right from the get-go regardless in hopes of taking out at least one enemy on round one. As for our steed, here's something nice. Thanks to the War Horse's trampling charge feature, if they move in a straight line for at least 20 feet and then hit with a hooves attack, the enemy has to make a DC 14 strength save or be knocked prone. If they are prone, the warhorse gets to make a second attack against them. Freeze of number crunching, I'm just gonna assume that there's a 50% chance that the enemy is prone on this first round, thanks to our warhorse's trampling charge. I think it's pretty safe to assume that we'll be able to charge in on round one, right? Combat starts, we're gonna be at least 20 feet away from our enemies most of the time. If not, we could probably back up and then charge. But also, if the enemy is prone thanks to trampling charge then we'll have advantage on attacks against them meaning that we should wait to see if we knock them prone before we use vow of enmity uh, letting you enmity. save it for a second enemy or maybe a second combat encounter if you have one before your next short rest right thanks horsey okay so under those thanks, assumptions Tony. against an enemy with a 10 armor class we would on average here do 74 total damage on average during our nova round round one and against an enemy with a 50 Pretty good. What, are, what level is this? Six? Teen that's pretty good at level six. 68 damage. And compared to other Nova damage builds that I've done to date at this level, that's pretty great. Call it bottom half of tier one. All right, Crit Fisher. Now, as far as how well this compares to my original Crit Fisher build, it's a little tough to say because that build was actually made for sustained damage, right? And so it's not really a very good apples to apples comparison. Yeah, it's a burst I mean, it was Nova. really more like a, here's the damage you would do on average, but save your smites for when you get a crit kind of thing. So it was sort of a burst damage build, but not a burst on demand build. And so the easiest way to calculate it seemed to be just assume you only smote when you got a crit. I know it's a little bit wonky, just like this is a little bit wonky to call it a crit fisher, but then crunch numbers like you're smiting regardless of whether you crit or not. Anyways, 
that build was averaging DPR that put them into tier two, so they were solid, but they didn't have smite by level six, this level, so they weren't even capable of much demand burst on demand burst damage anyways. I'll report back on how we compare in the final thoughts at the end. All right. With extra attack secured, along with smite and several spell slots to go along with it, I think it's time to turn our attention towards getting an even better crit chance. For this build, my favorite way to do that is via some fighter levels. Yeah. Yep, I saw that coming. Uh, champion fighter lowers your crit threshold, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah. I'll talk about hex blades a little later. But we. Okay, so the problem with hex blades is that your hex blades curse is a very temporary thing. You get it once per short rest. Um, it doesn't transfer to a new... It, I don't think it transfers to a new enemy. No, 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 no. I'm pretty... Like, I have... I'm playing a Hexblade uh, right now. I'm going to double check anyway. Um, just because I don't want to say something that's wrong. Attack of the Chain. We don't care about that. Armor of Hexes. Where is it? Where's Hexblade's Curse? Hexblade's Curse. Here it is. Okay, Hexblade's Curse. Um, the target is cursed for one minute. Curse ends early. If the target dies, you die or are incapacitated until the curse ends. Gain the following benefits. Um, you can crit local chance on a 19 or 20 and then d20. The bonus equals your proficiency bonus. If the target dies, you gain hit. Yeah, so you only get it once per short rest, essentially, on a 19 or 20, but at least it doesn't take concentration, which is nice. And they have to remove, they have to cast remove curse to be able to remove it. Um, so that's, that's pretty good. Uh, so unless you have, like, short rests in between every single fight, um, still, Champion Fighter is better to take if you always want that flat 19 or 20 on the D20 to be able to crit. We get a lot out of a few fighter levels. Wait, we're leaving Paladin behind? Aura of Protection is right there, dude. I know, I know. It is. You go it's ahead right and there. take Pally 6 first. Aura of Protection is awesome. To be fair, it's not quite as awesome for us since we only have a 14 Charisma, but it's still nice. I am beholden to the spreadsheet and only really have my eye on damage, which is why I'm doing this, but feel free damage. to be more well-rounded if you're playing this character in-game. Anyways, at Fighter 1, we get a fighting style. We, we get another fighting style, and since we've already got yes. Duelist and aren't actually planning on, like, dual wielding or using a heavy weapon on this build, Two I'm going to say fighting. let's just grab superior technique, which lets us or learn that. one maneuver from the Battlemaster maneuver list and also gives us one superiority die per short rest to fuel that maneuver with, though it's only a d6 as opposed to the normal d8. This can potentially add to our critical hits, and that's the main reason I want it anyways, and I'd probably grab either trip attack or menacing attack, as both let us add a d6 to our attack. attack when we hit, potentially knocking More the advantage. enemy prone or frightening them, depending on on which one you take and yeah i'd probably try and save this for when i crit personally unless you really need it otherwise at level eight we would be a fighter too and yeah if we're building for burst damage it's hard to leave out action surge right which would action let us now surge. take two actions once per short rest nearly doubling our damage potential on fun part about action surge is you can double cast fireball with action surge um, that is, yeah, that's, yeah, that is a hundred percent and completely viable. It's, um, super fun to do and it, uh, there's some ranged sorcerer or even like rain, like warlock. If you did Eldritch Blast, um, you could quick and cast Eldritch Blast, use your action to cast Eldritch Blast and then action surge and do another Eldritch Blast. Uh, it's called the Eldritch Minigun build. And that is also a very fun build. Our burst round now at level nine. I mean... Since we were going to get Action Surge anyways, we might as well go just one more level of fighter so that we can get our martial archetype, right? Our subclass, because that would let us pick up the champion archetype, that most vanilla of all subclasses, because most champions vanilla. get the improved critical feature, which says that we crit on a 19 or a 20, and thus we have finally arrived at that vaunted 27% chance to crit on a single attack when we have advantage. Okay, Which I think is the at most you can have in D &D it is time outside for of damage report. stuff. Damn Since last check, we have seen a pretty massive bump to our Nova round thanks to doubling our number of attacks and nearly doubling our crit chance. We've also added a little d6 of damage, potentially 2d6 on a crit, right? Thanks to superior technique. Quite notably, with advantage, elven accuracy, improved critical, and four attacks during our Nova round, there is about a 72% chance that at least one of our attacks will crit during our Nova round. So That's pretty good. Yeah, more often than not, on that opening round, we're going to crit at least once. So even if we're smiting on every attack, regardless, with a second level smite for two of them and a first level smite for the other two, 
I'd almost surely be waiting to use sneak attack and my superiority die until I rolled that 19 or 20, right? There's a really high likelihood that you're gonna get at least one. Anyways, if we went all out right on round one against an enemy with a 10 AC, we would on average do now 132 damage during our Nova round, and against a 16 AC, it would be just slightly less, 124 damage. That's pretty good. Um, what level was this? Seven to nine, so level nine. Yeah, I would say that that's doing a pretty good amount of damage even right before um, like level 10, because like for my Nova slash burst uh, build, which is pops off at either level 10 or 11, um, depending on if you took R of protection, um, that's that's pretty good, honestly. Like that's that's one that's almost, yeah, it's two, three, almost three levels lower that you're doing over 100 points of damage in a turn if everything goes well um which is what my build achieves at like level 10 to 11 uh, which is you know extremely fair now the only the only difference between my build and this build so far is that if the campaign keeps going and you keep going to higher levels the sustainability of your nova continues like your like the length of your burst um as rounds pass can continue into more rounds rather than just like the first opening one which is about double since last check, not surprisingly, but very gratifyingly. And compared to other Nova builds I've done to date at this level, that's kind of bottom half of tier one still. Really great place to be. And sure, you might not want to blow all of your resources in a single round of combat like this. It might be overkill. But if you just wait to crit and then unload everything that you can when you do, you're going to do 56 damage on average with just that one hit. That's awesome. Pile on three more attacks and you are very likely to take out most enemies that you'd be fighting at this level in a single round, even if you don't blow all of your resources. Boss all right, killer. at level 10, now that we've gotten most of what we need out of Fighter and Paladin and our crit chance as high as it can be, the best thing we can do for our burst damage here is to increase our increase spell, your spell slots, slots to get us bigger smites. And since we're already a charisma-based caster, that's going to mean going Bard, which could be great, Warlock, which has some pros and cons, or what I'm going to take, um, Sorcerer. Now oh, this is a triple, no, this is, is this a quadruple dip at this point? got rogue we have paladin we have fighter and now he wants to go sorcerer so he wants to do a quadruple dip okay i i i, I don't i don't do triple dips or I, I don't think i have a single build that does triple dips because like the pain of like watching your other like just your other players that are just focused on one build being able to do more damage or just do everything better than what you can do when you're sitting there, even at like a double dip can be, you know, a little saddening. This guy is mad that he's going into a quadruple dip. So the only issue I'm seeing with this build is that your burst sustain, you're, you're like you being able to sustain this burst as the rounds keep going on is like it's it's very it's basically zero, essentially. Like you're better off going into a big boss fight just like holding on to everything until you think the boss is a little bit weaker and then dunking on him if you live that long. Um, like, yeah, that's kind of the, like, that's kind of the issue with this build that I see so far. Now, let's break that decision down a little bit. If you're playing up to or beyond level 15, definitely consider Warlock. I, of course, strongly considered going Hexblade when putting this build together. Some of you have probably been scratching your head wondering why I didn't this entire time. Hexblade would give us a lot of things we want. Crit on a 19, Eldritch Smite. The big problem was I couldn't get to Eldritch Smite and have advantage by level 6 without a setup round. Sure, I could have without gone a setup Darkness Devil Sight, yep. right? But that takes around a round of setup, not to mention that it can be really obnoxious for everybody else at your table. And while going, say, yep. Vengeance Pally or Assassin... Something you can't forget is that when you cast Darkness, you literally create a dome of just something that nobody can see through. Um, which can cause a lot of problems. Like some people don't think about that. Like you can use it as cover, which is great, but like so can the enemies, and that's not always great. Rogue combined with Hexblade could have gotten me advantage without a setup round. I wanted to be able to crit fish with Elven Accuracy right for our first damage report and have extra attack, which kind of necessitated Vengeance Pally. Plus, I've already hit my limit of Hexblade dips this quarter with a Hexbow, and I kind of already did that Hexblade, Hexblade crit is so build good. anyways, uh, right up here. The Lockett and Bard, right? Besides, 
Going Sorcerer will actually give us more potential total burst damage over an entire round, uh, even later on in the game, for two reasons. Better spell slots, since multiclassing with Sorcerer and Paladin combines levels from both to give us more total spell slot levels, right? Uh, sure, it's slower multiclassing with a half caster like Paladin, but Warlock spell slots don't mix with other caster classes. But also because a Sorcerer Correct. will get us to Quickened Spell. As we will get into eventually. But if you're truly just saving those resources for when you crit and not just like blowing a smite on every single attack that you make on round one and hoping that at least one of them becomes a crit, then Warlock might be a little better thanks to Eldritch Smite, which you can apply to the same attack as Divine Smite if you have both, right? In that scenario, I mean, as a sorcerer, if we wait to crit and then smite with a fourth level spell slot and add sneak attack, I'm talking about like character level 15 here, we would crit for 75 damage. So as a warlock, if you wait to crit and then hit them with both a Divine Smite and an Eldritch Smite at the same time, your warlock spell slots are only going to be third level at that point if we follow the build up till this point the same way anyways. But both together would be 8d8 damage, right? Or 16d8 on a crit. Add sneak attack and you're doing 102 damage on average on a single critical hit. But, right, we're not building for a single hit necessarily. We're building for total burst damage potential even though when you play this character in game, you very well may be saving your smites for crits most of the time. Capiche? Mm. Okay, so why has your disciplined leader of an assassin's guild who has sworn an oath of vengeance suddenly started taking sorcerer levels here? I'm not sure. Perhaps the strain of their rigorous discipline became too much for them at some point. Something broke inside of them and unleashed forces of chaos that had been lying dormant inside but that they had been like bottling up maybe they actually exacted their vengeance fulfilled their oath and in a moment of exultant fervor manifested some strange new wild powers because at level one sorcerers get their subclass their sorceress origin and i would like to take wild magic no don't feels take wild like magic. a bit of an opposing force to the character that we've been building no i think seeing the pendulum Ah, wild magic. Um, wild magic sorcerers are fun until they're not, is the best way that I can put them. Like, the wild magic table is, it can be great. It can add some hilarity to the campaign, for sure. Um, but it can, it can also get old pretty quickly, in my opinion. Uh, unless the DM is, like, doing, putting in the extra work to, like, change up the wild magic table, uh, then things become uh, pretty entertaining. Um, if they continue to like change it up and stuff like that. But um, if you're just doing like the basic one, the basic one is you can get old you can get old pretty fast. You think a hundred, a um, hundred different magical effects that could happen on a D 100 chance would be a little bit more entertaining for a little bit longer, but I find it to be kind of quaint after a while swing far to the other side for this character could be really cool though and i bet you could come up with a great story reason for why it happened wild magic definitely is not necessary for the build to work or anything they get a couple of features here the first wild magic surge is what they're famous for it says that when you cast a sorcerer spell of first level or higher the dm can have you roll a d20 and if you roll a one then you roll a hundred sided die and see what kind of surge happens based on the wild magic surge table which can result in some pretty silly or awesome or painful stuff happening as usual though when i take wild magic the thing i'm mostly interested in here is the tides of chaos feature that they get of which course. says that once Gives per you long advantage. match you can just Give yourself advantage on an attack roll, save, or ability check. And this might be really nice to have for those of us with Elven Accuracy who are fighting a big fight, but we've already used up our Vow of Enmity and could really use a crit right about now okay, kind of that thing, explains right? it. Also, Tides we're told chaos. that the DM can just have you roll on the Wild Magic Surge table any time you cast a first level Sorcerer spell or higher, and afterwards you regain the use of your advantage. So, hey, if you and your DM are up for some potential insanity, you might be able to have another source of advantage somewhat regularly. As for the Sorcerer spells that we get at Sorcerer 1 here, I mean, of course we should grab Shield and Silvery Barbs, you know, speaking of finding more ways to give yourself advantage, right? But oh, I'm especially interested barbs. in Booming Blade and or Green Flame Blade. Uh, both of them do extra damage on a hit and then more damage, either if the one you hit moves before your next turn, in the case of Booming Blade, or damage to an adjacent enemy 
enemy in the case of green flame blade right now we're not going to be using these yet in fact not till the end of the build since casting these cantrips would take our entire action and it's not going to be as good as just taking the attack action but yeah like i say we will make use of them later at level 11 we would be a sorcerer too and that means we get font of magic these are just our sorcery points right we get one per sorcerer level and we can use them right now just to create more spell slots for ourselves which is we great that's, that's later we might want to also sacrifice spell slots to get more sorcery points uh, once we can use those for meta magic which we would pick up next level level 12 we'd be a sorcerer of three uh, we get to learn two meta magic options and i'm going to go for my favorite of course quicken spell which lets us quicken cast a spell. spell with a casting time of an action as a bonus action instead the meta Very thing nice. to take as and a as for the second one to take go ahead and, and pick your favorite uh, maybe grabbing twin spell or subtle spell or whatever too. your preference might be. Unfortunately, I'm not planning on making use of Quicken Spell yet because we need our bonus action still on round one for Vow of Enmity, right? If you are somehow able to get your Vow going before combat begins or don't mind waiting until round two to go Nova, sure. Quickening a Booming Blade on your Nova round or Green Flame Blade is a really nice way to add a little more Nova damage. At the moment, uh, both of those cantrips hit for an extra 2d8 damage on a hit. Those would double on a crit, right? And there's no reason you couldn't also add a smite to that hit as well or even sneak attack if you crit right i'm not going to assume that we're doing this yet though like i said i don't want any contingencies for this burst damage to just work right on round one we get second level sorcerer spells here though too and yeah there are lots of great options here of course misty step mind spike invisibility spider climb vortex warp web but the only one i'm going to mention for consideration on our nova round is my darling baby shadow blade it's great oh, in that it conjures a simple finesse sh shadow blade i should have seen that coming now that i think about it shadow blade is a very solid spell there are some misunderstandings about it um it literally creates a weapon for you so it counts as a weapon attack. Therefore, it adds your modifier and stuff like that. There's a lot of DMs that like, no, I don't know your mind. It does. It adds your modifier. I even think like Jeremy Crawford, like maybe disagree with that, but I don't listen to Jeremy Crawford. It creates a weapon. Um, it creates a finesse weapon, I do believe. Hold on. Let me check. Let me check the spell. Spells. And then we're going to do Shadow Blade. Uh, bonus action. Let's see. It counts as a simple melee weapon with which you are proficient. It deals 2d8 psychic damage on a hit and has the finesse, light, and throne properties. Yes. So some DMs think that it does that you don't add your dex modifier to it when you wield it, and that is wrong. You do add your dex modifier because it says that it is has the finesse, light, and throne abilities. And what does finesse give us allow us to do? It allows us to use strength or our dexterity modifier to attack with it. Therefore, when you attack with it, it adds your damage modifier to it. It doesn't say anywhere in the spell that it doesn't add your damage modifier. Therefore, it is a very solid thing. It gives you a nice 2d8, which is a pretty big bump. Uh, you can cast it at higher levels to give you even a larger bump, the max damage being 5d8. Um, so yeah, picking a, a dex paladin who can cast Shadow Blade and then casting... Uh, shadow blade at a seventh level to get that 5d8 and then smiting with a fourth level spot actually i can't I, I'm, I'm i'm feeling a build i'm feeling a build be, be starting to brew starting to brew in my chest and i'm very tempted to open up uh D, D beyond and make it um but we're gonna try and finish this video first that's weapon in your hand that does a ton of damage per hit 2d8 as a second level spell more if you upcast it but yeah the problem with it for this build is that it not only requires concentration but also costs a bonus action to cast like i've said we still need our bonus action for vow of enmity unless of course we're fighting in dim light or darkness because remember with shadow blade you and have you advantage on all of yes. your attacks if you're yes, standing yes. in dim light or darkness in that case absolutely summon the blade on round one with your bonus action then make your attacks enjoying some extra damage from the blade, assuming you don't have an amazing magic rape here by now, which of course you might, and not needing Vow of Enmity. I'm not going to assume that we're doing this, of course, like I've been saying, no contingencies, no setup rounds, but this will be really nice to have for those times that you're fighting in a dimly lit area. Right? Or again, maybe if you can somehow get the spell off like before combat begins. Don't forget that thanks to how multiclassing with spellcasters works, we do have third level spell slots now if we wanted to upcast a shadow blade for 3d8 damage per hit, or if we wanted to use those spell slots for 4d8 smites. Now, 
Um, I don't remember the ability scores that he said he had in the beginning, but the only problem with this is that Shadow Blade is, again, concentration. Uh, this is a spell that I argue should remain concentration because you can upcast it, it deals more damage, therefore, like if it always stayed 2d8, um, I would say that at eventually at higher levels, it would no longer, re you would no longer require concentration or whatever. But in this, and like at this stage, since it can be turned into a 5d8 on an attack, that should definitely be concentration unfortunately and if i remember correctly i don't think he made this character with a very high con which means that you are pretty likely to lose shadow blade not only is that an issue but shadow blade can also be dispelled so if you bonus action summon it um and you don't quite get up to your nova turn to be able to use it it might be dispelled by say a lich boss or something like that before you can even touch him with it um, that's kind of like the big, that's another biggest issue that I see with Shadow Blade, but that's besides the point. At level 13, we would be a sorcerer of four, meaning we get an ability score increase or feat, and that would let us get our dexterity to 20 and cap it finally, which will be a nice increase to both our hit chance and our armor class and our yep. damage on a hit and all of our roguish skills and utility. Okay. At level 13, it is time for our next damage report. Damage report. Since last check, we have capped our dexterity picked up more and higher spell slots for smiting, plus picked up some nice utility potential and general versatility that comes from sorcerer levels and spells. Our tactics, though, haven't really changed much, and so against an enemy with a 10 armor class here, we would on average do 167 damage, and against oh, a 17 armor damage. class, it would be 159 during our Nova round. Only a few points lower, right? I just, ugh. This is why I love Elven Accuracy so much. It almost makes the so enemy broken. AC irrelevant or practically so but compared to other nova builds that i've done to date uh, this puts us more like in the middle of tier two by comparison we've plateaued a bit since last time we're still in a great place we just want to do more than simply increase our smite damage if we want to see bigger gains which we will try and do here shortly at level 14 it finally makes sense from the spreadsheets perspective anyways to just Go ahead and grab Paladin 6 now. We've capped our dexterity with Sorcerer levels, and taking one level of Paladin does just as much for our spell slots as taking another level of Sorcerer would. Remember, when multi-classing half casters with full casters, we take the number of half caster levels, cut them in half, round down, and then add that number to the full caster levels when trying to figure out how many spell slots we have, right? So Paladin 5 was only getting us two levels of full caster, essentially, for spell slot purposes. Going to Pali 6 gets us three levels of full caster. Follow me? And yeah, that also means we get the arguably overpowered Aura of Protection, which increases our saving throws by our Charisma modifier and does the same for all of our allies within 10 feet. Very nice. Uh, but would be nicer if we had a higher Charisma. Must resist explain <laughs> anyways yes uh, resist this means dip. then that we have fourth level spell slots now so we can if we want smite for the cap of 5d8 on a hit right or 10d8 on a crit at level 15 since we only have one fourth level spell slot i figured let's take one more sorcerer level making us a sorcerer five so that we can have two of them at least plus sure i mean that means we get third level sorcerer spells and i mean yeah i'd love to have spirit shroud or haste and add those to the damage report, not to mention Counterspell and Fear and Hypnotic Pattern and Fly and all the other great third level spells, right? The problem with, you know, things like Spirit Shroud or Haste is that they require a setup. So, yep, no, require setup. I'm just going to say pick your favorite here. And yeah, if you can get one of those off before combat starts, go for it. Uh, I still think Shadow Blade's going to be a little bit better depending on what magic weapon you'd be replacing Shadow Blade with if you had one. But yeah, I don't want to have to sacrifice my bonus action or action on round one to cast any of these spells if I'm trying to prioritize Nova damage right from the get go. Kind of crazy, right? I'm not assuming that we're concentrating on anything. This whole freaking build feels almost sacrilegious. But hey, it is nice knowing that we can do big burst right away without needing to make any assumptions, I think. At level 16, with a couple of fourth level spell slots under our belt for smiting now, finally, I think I'd actually want to end the build with some more rogue levels to give ourselves two more damage bumps. A fairly big one and a fairly small one. So yeah, we're ending where we started. We've come full circle here. So this means we'd be a rogue two here, and that gives us cunning action. This lets cunning us action. dash, disengage, or hide as a bonus action instead of an action. That's kind of nice. But then finally, for us, at level 17, we would be a rogue three. And I really wanted to get to this level in rogue. I wish I could have gotten here sooner because it gives us our rogue subclass, our roguish archetype. And what do you think I'm going with? 
I mean, sure, Arcane Trickster would be nice to help out our spell slot progression. This would mean a fifth level spell slot no, among assassin. other things. But I want to go assassin. Why? Called it. Primarily so because good. of the assassinate feature, which tells us, sure, that if we hit an enemy that's surprised, then the attack is an automatic crit. But that's just gravy here as far as I'm concerned for this build. Again, I want this character to be something that just works right on round one without any kind of contingencies or setup or anything. So, sure, if you can surprise your enemy, congratulations. But no, what I'm most interested in here is the fact that also with Assassinate, you have advantage on attacks against anyone who hasn't gone in combat yet. Wait a sec. Another advantage. We already have advantage thanks to Vow of Enmity. Isn't this redundant? Uh, Kinda, sure, but not really. Because while it is nice to just get advantage on demand, Vow of Enmity... You also automatically crit if they are surprised. That is the another benefit of Assassin, and I'm pretty sure that's what he's going for, is that if you can surprise them, you can crit them. And delete them before they ever knew that you were there. It takes a bonus action, and... I was okay relying on that while I was building up everything else because we got so much out of all the other classes that we took first. I tried crunching the numbers and working this in sooner, and it just didn't make sense mathematically anyways to sacrifice bigger smites from Sorcerer. But now that we've gotten pretty much everything that we need from those other classes, going back to Rogue here will essentially let us free up that bonus action during our Nova round, meaning we could use it to, you guessed it, Quick and Booming Blade or Green Flame Blade with our bonus action on round one instead of using Vow of Enmity, which, now that we're level 17, by the way, are going to hit for an extra 3d8 damage. Very nice. We also get Steady Aim, which says that steady we can use aim. our bonus action to give ourselves advantage on our next attack this turn, but only the next attack, right? Not every attack. And we have to sacrifice our movement to do it. Again, sure, maybe outside of round one, if you just really need advantage on an attack and you've used up your Tides of Chaos ability, right? You could use this, then maybe just Booming Blade with your action even, hoping for a big, huge critical, right? The small damage bump I mentioned comes from the fact that Sneak Attack goes up to 2d6 here uh, with three levels of Rogue, right? And that will be 4d6 on a crit. And so, for our final damage report. Final damage report! Since last check, we've not only capped our potential damage from Divine Smite and increased our sneak attack a bit, but we've also added a fifth attack on our Nova round thanks to a Quickened Booming Blade or Green Flame Blade attack, as well as picked up some nice defensive and utility options along the way. Oh, and by the way, with five attacks in a round, now that we're Quickening a Booming Blade, right, our chance of getting at least one critical hit during our Nova round has gone up to almost 80%. 80%. And so, against an enemy with a 10 armor class here, on average, we would do two hundred and forty seven and against an AC eighteen it would be two hundred and thirty six. And that's a nice bump, putting us kind of top of tier two compared to other burst damage builds that I've done to date at so again, this relies on you being able to get to levels four to seventeen. And this final build requires you to get up to level seventeen. Most campaigns never even go that high. And one of the primarily prim, primary reasons, sorry, primary reasons why this is is because of ninth level spells. There are a lot of DMs, especially newer DMs, that don't want to deal with ninth level spells. I am one of them. I don't want to deal with I don't want to deal with ninth level spells. There are ways that you can deal with them. Um, like if you're super afraid of like wish and stuff like that, like you can add components as the DM, you can just add components. Or like a requirement, like they have to like learn the the spell wish. They can't just take it when they get up to that high enough level. Um, but back to my original uh, statement of like you don't really want to deal with night level spells. Right? At level sixteen is when a lot of classes get their ninth level spell slot, uh, which is yep, uh, which is wizard. Um, oh no, I take that back. No. Oh no, wizards don't get. No, wizards do not get their ninth level spell slot at level 16. Never mind. Hold on. Why did I say the things that I say then? Because I, if I remember correctly, mass heal. Hmm. I think somebody made an oopsie on the last. on the last thing that I. Last one shot that I ran. I don't think he was supposed to have mass heal. Unless I level, ran it at level 18. I might have ran that at level 18 now to come to think of it. Okay, so never mind. Um, I take that back. Actually, level 16 is kind of my sweet spot. I've ran a lot of one shots at level 16. 
Um, those are super fun. You can really go ham uh, with like monsters that you create and stuff like that. Uh, like one of the monsters that I threw against a level 16. Um, is he in here? He is in here. Yes. Is I made this stat block, which is not available on the Patreon, but I guess I'll give a little bit of a sneak peek. Just a quick peek. This one isn't all um, uh, specialized and pretty yet, um, but I had them fight um, Yvatl, the god of reality. Um, one of the reasons this isn't on the Patreon yet is because I need to, I need to, I, I need to flesh it out a little bit more. There's a couple of stuff on here that are a little out of um, theme as far as um, this this god goes and stuff like that. So I kind of need to clean it up. Um, but this is a stat block that I have ran against uh, level 18 characters and that they have triumphed against. Uh, now they did fight him by himself, but that's typically how I like to run my boss fights. Is uh, just a main bad guy that can um, pretty much do things on his own without any additional assistance. It makes the fight super simple. You get to fight, you get to use one stat block that has a lot of cool shit that you can remember a lot easier than if, um, say, you had to throw, um, like, you know, Tiamat or something like that. Because even at, like, these higher levels, um, I've read a few stories, like, even at higher levels, like, T even Tiamat herself needs like minions and able to help her for the fight to um, be any kind of be decent in any kind of way. Um, so that's typically how I like to make my monsters able to stand on their own 647 hit points um, and with a bunch of like resistances and a bunch of special abilities to like spell absorption uh, to suffer no damage from different spells and stuff like that. And yeah, he still needs some cleaning up to do. I believe that in my foundry, actually, that he is different than what is listed here. So this is not the final draft whatsoever. That's kind of a sneak peek of him. Um, let's see, another, another monster that I make um, or I made that can stand on his own two feet. Um, but, you know, kind of to go back to my original point is like most campaigns don't go this high a level. So you see this amount of damage that you can deal that he is describing, which is 200 points of damage in a Nova turn and stuff like that. Like that is what some DMs are afraid of. Like these videos are out there. Just anybody can watch this. We're watching it right now. And somebody can build into this build. And 200 and what did he say? 260 hit points or something like that. Did he put material? Hold on. Where's the damage report? Did he not do the damage? Okay, 200. Here it is. 247 damage. So even with my one of my homebrewed baddies, which you're supposed to take at a pretty high level, uh, like, um, oh, here. I need to sort by create a date. That's why I can't find what I want. Okay, so where is he? Yes, so the Fathomless. I've ran the Fathomless. The Fathomless is a is a pretty difficult fight. Um, this is probably one of my nastier builds other than the Gloomblade Grudge. The Gloomblade Grudge is pretty nasty. Uh, but this one, you were, uh, I put him at levels 15 plus uh, because he has Fell Portent, essentially, which gives him a recharging portent ability. And for any of you that are like, what recharging portent? That's so, bu so busted. You are right, and you are also wrong. Uh, because if you run this fight right, uh, it'll be a great fun fight that you can use a recharging portent as the DM. Um, and if the players are very good players, they will be able to burn through the rechargeable portents each round without it being too much of an issue. Uh, but anyway, he's 15 plus because he can um, he can essentially enter people's minds and mess with their minds with a kind of like supercharged charm uh, charm ability. Um, and anyway. With that damage, he could delete this, you know, this creature that's meant for levels 15 plus um, in one in one Nova turn. Like, it's just gone. Like, this big fight that has been built up to for, like, weeks and weeks and weeks and months and months and months, depending on the campaign, is just over in one turn because of this build. Um, that's why a lot of uh, campaigns don't go to this high level, because there is some insane stuff that you can make, like what he is demonstrating here. Now... The Fathomless is definitely a monster that is not meant to be ran by itself, uh, which is why I get, which is why it has such low hit points, and which is why I have given it. Um, let's see, where is it? Not Devouring Gloom. Uh oh, is Devouring Gloom also on my Gloomblade Grudge? 
It is. I have the same ability. Oh, no. <gasps> and that's on the Patreon. I'm going to have to fix that. Oh, well. Moving on. Not a big deal. I'll just have to rename it. Um, Not Devouring Gloom. Uh, where is it? He can use an action. Dark. Oh, yes. Dark, dark Potential. As an action, the Fathomless breathes life into the corpse of a beast or a monstrosity. Over the course of 1d4 days, the corpse changes into a fell beast. Um, so, yeah. This is a fight that is not meant to be done alone. It is meant to be done against the Fathomless and a number of fell beasts with it that it has created. Um, to kind of help it and be a little bit of chunky damage sponge. So that's why they have 135 hit points, because it is supposed to be a difficult fight, 15+. plus. Um, and then, yeah, somebody would be like, well, this thing can you know make as many as it wants, but th that's why you are the DM, and that's why you uh, balance things for your players so that it's still fun and they don't get absolutely ruined. Uh, but this is a creature that could potentially be a big boss of one of your campaigns, because it's meant for levels 15+, plus. most campaigns end before then. And he's able to build an army, essentially. Build an army of these fell beasts. Um, it's on the snap block. It's all that kind of stuff. I'm going to have to rename uh, Devouring Gloom and update the Patreon. Uh, but other than that, he is he is there and available for those who want to run him. You even get a sneak peek here. I should probably stop giving a sneak peek because he could just... Well, technically I've scrolled through it all, so you could just like freeze frame it, I suppose. But I'm not too worried about it, honestly. The Patreon's pretty cheap. You know, just be nice. It's like five bucks. Five bucks to subscribe and get all the stuff that I make for D&D. &D. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of like one example of like why some DMs are like super afraid of these super high levels is because of the stuff that players can build. And that's not even taking into account, like he said, any magical items. That's just the abilities that are in the game and allowing uh, multi-class to exist, which is why some DMs banish um, multi-classing is because of the super broken stuff that you can make. Um, now, this is pretty much, I don't think we need to finish up this video anymore. Um, we've already taken about an hour and a half to like try and get through it. Um, it, it very cool build, 100%. Uh, has good sustainability. Um, I already have my kind of qualms with it, um, which is the fact that its burst, like its sustained burst is not very high at all. Um, I would argue that um, at that 17th level, uh, like let's see, I can... Just for shits and giggles, I can level her up to level. She's not in a campaign or anything, so I can just level her up. Um, so at level 17, my uh, character's burst, my sustainable burst is much, much, much higher. He will eventually, like his build will run out of spell slots. There's no avoiding it. It'll run out of spell slots super fast. Uh, this one will not run out of them as fast because you have a bunch um, yeah, you have 7th level spell slots, you have 6th level spell slots, you have 5th, you have 3 fourths, you have 3 thirds, and that's, and this is, and then you also have, um, if you want to save, uh, your, uh, uh, sorry, sorcery points, you can save your sorcery points to give yourself back some spell slots and stuff like that, so, yeah, the, this is much more sustainable as far as that goes, and she's got a lot of flavor and flair, um, and, yeah. Uh, to kind of give you an example of how high your uh, just plus damage, like she has a plus 13, which is incredible. Uh, the only reason she has a plus 13, however, is because of the belt of Storm Giant Strength, uh, which is uh, a great item, especially for a Strength Paladin, which is super fun. I don't even think, oh no, she does have dueling. Okay, she does have dueling on there. So slap that on. I debated on giving her uh, Rage. Uh, but if I gave her rage, she wouldn't be able to concentrate on spells, so we can't, unfortunately, go down that route, uh, which makes us sad. Um, but it is understandable. Um, but yeah, this is my build. That's his build. His build's pretty good. Um, it's ridiculous damage. Um, you're going to wish that your campaign can go that high a level. There's not a lot of DMs that are willing to run campaigns to that high of a level. I am one of them, um, just so you know. So if you got a group of friends reach out to me. Maybe I can open some time up to run a campaign, but I am happy to go at least to level 16 and 17. Um, I'm not too sure about level 18 because that's when ninth level spell slots come into play and that's when things get um, kind of ludicrous. Um, I already have it into one of my campaigns that players want to go to level 20 in, which I'm still hemming and hawing a little bit, and I've told them that, but I'm probably going to take him to level 20. Um, but in that one, I've already... I'm going to start being pretty open that uh, the spell Wish is going to have a lot more requirements than you just getting up to the ninth level spell slots and then being able to just take Wish. 
Like, nah, man. Nah, man. Um, we're not doing that. Um, but yeah. If and you see all this other stuff they get a sneak peek of. Uh these all of these are on the Patreon. I'm always um I update the Patreon at least once a month. Um I was usually I try to hit like four different postings or a four different PDFs or whatever. Um I didn't hit that this month, I hit two. Um so I kind of just aim for two to four at least every month. It's only five bucks, it's super cheap. Um, but yeah, you can take a look at that and see what you think about the stuff that I make. I also make magic items. Um, I make these super powerful late game magic items um, that are super fun. Like the most recent one I made is the actuality piercer. Uh, this one was super fun to make. I actually made it for a character from um, an NPC, technically, that is from a certain stream um, run by a certain long haired man. And I made it for her because I thought she would definitely have as um, as a blade singer that she would definitely have some kind of like super pumped up uh, magic weapon or something like that. But this magic weapon's super cool. Um, it allows you to penetrate through cover and be able to strike at a creature behind that cover if you succeed a perception check DC um, at the like exalted stage. And not only that, but it gives you a weightless robe of sil silver steel thread um, that puts your ace in your where your AC can be no longer no lo no lower than 18 um, plus any like benefits. Um, but you're already wearing a robe, so you can't really put any armor on top of that, stuff like that. Um, in addition to that, the robe also tries to prevent you from dying permanently. It's kind of like a little, kind of like a souped up contingency spell into it, um, which is super fun. Um, but this is this PDF is on the Patreon if you want it permanently in your uh, download folder and that sort of thing. But yeah, um, this is just some of the stuff I make. I'm very passionate about this. I'd really like to see the Patreon um, get to be a little bit more up there as far as things go. Um, my name is attached to all of it. You can see it, Mithrim Archivum, um, stuff like that. You can go to join the Discord, the Mythic Athenium, all that good stuff. Uh, the YouTube channel, um, I will show that real quick. Uh, the YouTube channel did used to have um, some of the campaigns that I was running, um, but unfortunately I had to unlist them. Um, there was somebody that uh, that was part of one of my part of one of my games that really wasn't a great member, um, which I kind of knew that for a while, but I thought it was just something that I was feeling for the most part. Uh, but it turns out that after a certain amount of time, other people were starting to feel that as well. They had to be removed. And looking back at some of the behavior that they exhibited in some of the uh, games, I decided I didn't want that on my YouTube channel anymore. Um, so we're I'm basically going to soft. Uh, lot, soft relaunch uh, one of my current campaigns uh, now that they're gone and we've had a session uh, an unrecorded session so everybody got kind of back in the groove everybody's a little bit more comfortable now um but yeah and also this vod will be posted on the youtube channel as well so you can take a look at it um but yeah honestly i think that's all i have tonight i think the only thing i want to show off real quick is one of my favorite builds uh which is a character that i am currently playing right now uh, which is Kylan Umbrasil. She's one of my favorite characters I've made. I wrote a very long backstory that I am constantly being made fun of um, for writing so long. Uh, but she is an what I like to call an Eldritch Sniper. Uh, now you're going to see some extra stuff like here, like some extra feats um, that I'm not technically supposed to be able to take like as far as canon, but our DM is super nice. He hands out like free feats and stuff like that. He allows us to work on certain feats and during downtime uh, within reason. Uh, so I'm able to take things like Meta Magic of Depth, Skill Expert, um, Echoing Soul is actually that is I was about to say that that's homebrew, but it's in like Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft or something like that. Echoing Soul is pretty cool. I gave it to my character to turn her into a, um, yeah, basically a paranoid schizophrenic, uh, which has been super fun to play. Uh, she's a quirky little paranoid schizophrenic. She's great. Uh, this game is is recorded, but we kind of just we have it unlisted and privated. Um, I've thought about maybe publishing it at some point on the YouTube channel. I'm still kind of hemming and hawing it. Um, I'm kind of hoping that a couple of players are going to get a little bit better audio set up um, because they don't have a very good one. We have like a lot of technical issues, so it wouldn't exactly be super fun to watch. Um, so that's why we kept it unlisted so far. It is recorded, but it is unlisted as of this current time. I would also have to pay for like overlays and stuff like that. But maybe at some point I'll be able to start like streaming those episodes and stuff on my channel. 
Uh, it would be mid campaign. So essentially we would have to like soft relaunch and do like character intros and stuff like that. If we wanted to post it onto the YouTube channel. Um, it's not exactly a game that you can just like join will and nilly. It is paid. We are a close knit group of people um, over the past couple of years that have come together. Uh, the last person that um, I had to ask to leave, he was with us for uh, six months or so, probably a little bit more than six months, but um, it takes a while. We only meet like once a month, twice a month, so it takes a while to kind of fill people out. Sometimes sometimes people are, you know, covert narcissists, and you don't realize that until they have soft launched their crazy, essentially. <laughs> that's what how, what, what one of my friends puts it. Um, but yeah, I think that's it for tonight. Um, guys, thank you so much for dropping by. Uh, for those of you that did, um, yeah, check out the Patreon, all that kind of stuff. I'm actually going to bring it down to a single tier. I have two tiers, and I just realized the other day that I don't really know why I have two tiers. Um, so I'm going to fix that here pretty soon, bring it down to one tier. It's just going to be five bucks. Um, you get access to everything that I ever make. Um, and the goal is to someday compile all of these, get artwork done for them. And slap it into a super beautiful physical book. Get some physical merch for the Mythic Athenium. And then once that um, hopefully gets done, maybe um, someday uh, I'll have a store. And someday I'll have a website. And someday I'll have a company called the Mythic Athenium. Like, wouldn't that be cool? That is that is the dream. But as of now, it is a very slow process. I'm not hiring anybody. The project's not making any kind of money. Um, so don't even bother like reaching out, um, to be hired or anything like that. Like you would essentially be, you would have to be a volunteer, um, to help like edit or otherwise, whatever you are. So just, you know, keep that in mind. Um, but other than that, I hope everyone has a very good night. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for to anybody who watched and yeah, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.